So, I'm sorry. Dear colleagues, we should start. It will be no live streaming, but it will be after uploaded the video. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this panel discussion on the crucial role of the global. Global. What is global? Global is global water analysis laboratory network. It was launched by our director general Rafael Grossi in UN Water Conference in New York. It addressed gaps in water-related data and information, and sharing knowledge in, and transferring this knowledge and technology. Today we have esteemed experts from various fields who will show us and share us experience on progress made on water management, on data, on cooperation, on networking. Before introducing our guests and panelists, please let open this discussion with the video message of our Director General, Rafael Grossi. We are living through a climate crisis. We are living through a climate crisis. And a pollution crisis. They both have an impact on water availability and water quality. Although countries and regions are affected differently, the world is far off track in achieving SDG 6 on clean water and sanitation. But there are things we can do. The IEA has over 60 years of experience supporting countries in generating reliable national water data using nuclear techniques. We use this data to determine the size and location of water sources and the origins of groundwater recharge. We can trace path pollutants and assess the impact of climate change. We want to bring this capacity to all countries. As part of the UN Water Action Agenda, we are advancing the IAEA's new Global Water Laboratory Network, GLOWAL, to support countries in achieving SDG 6. National water laboratories are the cornerstone of a country's ability to manage its water resources and to develop strategies for climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. Through the global network, countries will be able to generate their own water data to better understand their water resources, strengthen national water resource governance, and increase the resilience of their water supply. We are improving the analytical capacity of regional and national water laboratories and fostering cross-boundary collaboration on transboundary resources. That's how we enable more effective mitigation and adaptation strategies to address climate change and build trust through transparency. We're not only working with country, but also at UN agency and organizations levels. Our initial target regions are Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean and Central Asia. Many countries in these regions are at the forefront of climate change. The ultimate goal of the global network is to ensure that countries across the globe have the skills and the capacity to meet the water demands of current and future generations. Join us in supporting the global network and protecting our precious water resources. So now I can introduce our panelists. So today with us is His Excellency, Mr. Juan Francisco Facetti. He is a resident representative of UN Permanent Mission of the Republic of Paraguay to the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have also Mr. Johannes Kuhlmann, who is UN Water Vice Chair. We have with us Ms. Ruth Spencer, she is advisory board member 
for the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and the UN Civil Society of Women from San John's Antigua and Barbuda. Also, we have with us Martin Krause, our Director of Technical Cooperation. And for closing, here we have a special day, uh, guest, Her Excellency Bonnie Dennis Jenkins. She's Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security, United States of America. So thank you for joining us today. And let me to start from the first question. I'm sorry, I'm just talking a little bit. So I don't know. And um, Honorable Mr. Facetti, Global Network, it was established to address the global need for improved water analysis and monitoring, would enable countries to generate own data and to improve the water management. Please, could you tell us what on which role on global can play for Paraguay? Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Vistana. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, event, which is absolutely important in these times of, of uh, climate crisis, as it was mentioned by the DG Grossi. And thank you for inviting me to share this, uh, this uh, moment with such uh, remarkable uh, persons that are also very much involved in, 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 in this issue. Yeah, for Paraguay, I would like to tell you that 93% um, of our exports, 93% are directly or indirectly linked to water. Water is the uh, um, the resource um, for, you know, is the raw material, I would say, uh, to produce energy. Paraguay is the largest uh, producer and exporter of clean energy per capita in the world. We are exporting our elect hydroelectricity to Brazil and Argentina. So we are very much, this export is very much dependent to, wa to, to water. And also we are, we provide food for 80 million people. We are only five, 6.5 per, uh, p million people, but we provide food for 80 million people. So, and this food is coming from the agriculture as well as the cattle raising and other kind of uh, of um, of cattle. Um, so, water for us is absolutely um, is our resources that we have to care and protect. But also, you know, we have uh, uh, a law uh, approved in 2000 that establish or or regulate the 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 use of water and also um, provide some priorities for us uh, these priorities are first of all water for drinking drinking water and water for um, um for uh, i mean water coming from the environment and for the nature from the nature and for the nature water for uh, industry and water for production, for agriculture, and as I mentioned, to uh, cattle raising. Um, so we need, under these uh, priorities, uh, we need to establish, uh, an or and we need to build a data baseline, very strong, very robust, in order to, based on that, prepare our guidelines, for instance, or standard guidelines for water quality, standard for waste water or effluents. And um, so this is one very important um, uh, objective and goal that we have. Secondly, um, we are sharing, and this is also extremely important for us. My country is sharing one of the most important wetlands in the world, which is the Pantanal. We are sharing this uh, water resources with uh, Brazil and Bolivia. We are sharing also the largest, one of the largest aquifers in the world, which is the aquifer Guarani, which has a very good quality, uh, water quality for drinking. And, uh, and we are sh sharing also other, other um, fresh waters with other countries. Uh, so we cannot build 
absolutely uh, an environmental policy, a national environmental policy, without taking care of what our neighbors are doing with these uh, uh, resources also. So we need to establish a dialogue with them. Based on that, uh, this dialogue has to be based in evidence. And what kind of evidence we are talking about? Water quality data. So we need to have also this water quality um, uh, data baseline. And to build this, we need um, to have a update um, or up-to-date laboratories capacities, um, soft and hard uh, technology. I mean, soft is the, the human resources and the hard technology is the equipment used in the laboratories. We need to have also um, uh, policies and or tools of policies like these guidelines. And, and also we need to have capacities in order to understand all these data. And so for that, we need, um, and also train people, of course. And finally, based on my experience, I was a director general of the National Institute of Technology and Standards in the 90s. I was minister of environment of my country. So I worked a lot with some agencies of the UN system. And I can tell you, I can tell all the audience that the most qualified agency that has, uh, that can reach all the regions of the world and has the capacity is developing techniques, is developing um, um, procedures and, and protocols, is developing um, reference standard materials and has a very strong technical cooperation with them and structure is the International Atomic Energy Agency. So for me, from my point of view, the most qualified and, uh, with, uh, and competent agency within the UN system is the, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency to build this global uh, network. And through this global network, the agency can be a very important support for our countries in order to, to create what I said, uh, capacities uh, uh, at the domestic level, um, also promote this dialogue between other laboratories in other countries, and in order to exchange capacities, exchange knowledge, and, and fulfill with this objective that is uh, envisaged and is defined by the by the DG Grossi. Thank you. Thank Sorry you for being so so extended. Thank you very much because how you saw at the national level all importance of global what we are trying to bring to our member states. And also thank you so much because you mentioned something very important here about the data. We can manage better something what we understand. Without data, we cannot understand it better. And this was the highlights of UN Water Conference in New York. And here, I would like to ask Johannes Kuhlman, who is one of the leaders in the UN organizations and have experienced this organization, but also their participation in UN Water. Johannes, please, could you provide us with the overview of the importance of the addressing gaps in water-related data and information? and how this subject is covered in the agenda of UN water-related agencies. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Hello, everybody. I think uh, I want to start from what we want. I think what we all want and what you have talked about is resilience or is a system, is a country that can provide the services and the livelihoods that or the conditions for livelihoods and security that the people want to have. So we want to have resilience. We we want to uh, especially have that because we know our boundaries are so changing now. So I don't know that 50 years ago, we thought the world we live in is a stationary process. Now we know it's not the case. And so we need to rethink our systems that are all targeted to, okay, this is a stationary system. And if I have a problem, I just 
um, provide from the outside a different input into my system and networks. But now with climate change and with population growth and with water demand, we are at a situation where this model doesn't work anymore. We cannot just go somewhere else and get some more that, that we have understood that now. And <clears throat> to provide now management schemes or different ways how sectors and countries can work together to provide resilient water management solutions, we need to first and foremost know how is the water resource changing in quality and quantity over time? And um, um, how can we create systems that can provide storage function or cleaning function, natural cleaning or uh, infrastructure to clean water, to uh, supply clean water in the right place at the right time. And to do that, we need to understand this water cycle and to model it for prediction. For understanding the water cycle, the global provides this um, one best chance to validate how old the water is and how long it stays where. If we don't know that, we cannot appropriately plan for water security for the future because we plan with X amount of water. We want to have that also in the future, but we don't know that of this X amount, the half was maybe fossil or is not renewable or so. And this is exactly why we are using the isotope analysis and why global is so important in this regard. And then we also need that for um, validating climate models or global hydrological models for having the right compartments in our models. We cannot use any extrapolation, any forecast into the future if we don't know which compartments we are addressing. If it's a black box model, an empirical thing where we don't know how that water changes, we will predict something that is likely not going to be realized in 30 years or so. So that's number two. And number three, I think you have already alluded to that, is the yeah the potential of something like the global for countries to come together across I don't know political divides. And we had that in New York in the water conference. We had countries talking about a global water information system or community that are coming from very far ends of the geopolitical spectrum. But it creates a chance for people to work together on something that provides a benefit on the global scale. So I think those this this is a little bit the gaps that I see, the understanding and knowledge, the prediction, and the peaceful cooperation on topics that are not yeah that are mutually beneficial for all. So first, <laughs> I should stop here. I think Julia very much so. Cooperation is important. Networking is important. I think everyone agrees here what networks makes us stronger. But we have scientists, we have policy makers. But what about society? Please can now I address the next question to Ruth. Ruth, uh, civil society expert. How will human rights process guide the water conversations and become fully integrated with your organizational mentioned at the national, international, and regional levels. Thank you. I'm from a small island, and everything connects. So water is a key nexus to food, health, so many things, production. And you know that the UN passed a resolution that human rights agreement. Everyone has rights to a clean, healthy environment. And without water, you're going to be dirty. You're going to have poor health, sanitation problems. That's what forced me to start working with communities with water because the nurse of a major clinic called me and said, I'm seeing too many, you know, impact in children the older ones from not having water. And the island has traditionally suffered from drought, not enough water. And if you go into the archives, because when I'm doing the research with the groups, we go into the archives. And since in the 1890s, the British built five reservoirs on the island. 
in strategic places where the soils and the natural in infrastructure was well suited. And because of the ongoing drought in the island, we started to restore these reservoirs. And we didn't know where they were because over the years they weren't used and there, you know, a lot of trees and vegetation covered them. But the older heads told us where they were and we started to clear. And we found that all these reservoirs had no crack. But the covers, the reservoir covers were all rusted, the galvanized, and the spillways that took the water to the reservoirs were all covered with trees. But we have been restoring them. So I'm not going to blame climate change for our water problems. I think it has resulted from poor planning. You know, you don't. Right now, we have no groundwater resources. Our wetlands are in deplorable states. Actually, our landfill is in the wetlands. And you can imagine, you know, everything is thrown there, e-waste. So the very mangroves are degrading. So our focus for water is on the soils. We have to build soils to enable that filtration, that purification of the water. And the community groups, they don't have a lot of funds, but our mindset is the circular approach. So what we have been doing, like waste, organic waste, everybody likes a nice lawn. So you see people taking the lawn more, the weed whackers, and all the grass is pushed aside. But we would go and pick it up and we take it to our gardens, to our plots, and we spread it out. All the leaves that fall, we use it. All the fish guts, you go to the market, the people are selling the fish, what are they doing with the guts? Nothing. We bury all these things, and we that has been helping our soil. And it also increases the water hold in content of the soil, so when the rains come, the waters can go down. So this is how communities have been adapting to the drought. Because when, the, when, we, when schools have to close, many times there's no water. If you, if you follow my country and the news, maybe two, three days a week you have water. It's really We have transitioned to desalination, but there's a major cost with desalination, electricity costs. And the technical work with the location of these desal plants was not perfected. And you're hearing all kinds of problems. You have to change membranes. One membrane costs 8,000 US. So it's just, you know, sucking out money out of the government's treasury. So we are in a dilemma, but the local people, how they're trying to adapt, those stories are not being told in our national reporting. And sometimes I wonder with the data that's going out when you don't include your local stakeholders, especially the local groups, they're not viewed as stakeholders. The government sees the Chamber of Commerce, the unions as the stakeholders, but the local people who are on the ground, on the front line, seeking to protect, you know, the very ecosystems because we have hoteliers, we have investors given protected areas for the investment. We want to cut, you know, some of the coastal mangroves so the local people have to cry out. You hear them on the radio. I mentioned to my partner here, my country ratified the Eskazo Agreement. I, I, does anybody know, ever heard about the Eskazo Agreement? The first international human rights agreement for Latin America and the Caribbean. It came out of the 1992 Rio Summit, but it took almost 26 years for it to be adopted. So it came into force 2018. But that agreement basically said governments alone don't have the answers for environmental problems. You need stakeholders, you need the public. 
And so we use this agreement, which is legally binding, push for our inclusion. Give us the information. We don't want to hear something on the radio. The government is bringing in this program or this project. Come with the, give us the information. Come to our communities. Let's discuss it. Have local ownership and buy-in. Otherwise, you're going to have lots of gaps with implementation. So me as a local community representative, I come to these meetings to be a voice. Lots of things are happening locally, but that data. Of course, the conventions. I talk with chemicals and pollutions because we are trying to stop the importation of these chemicals. Use for spraying mosquitoes that are killing the pollinators. We have to open our voice. We live on the ground. We know what's happening. And we have to alert the government. Things are not going right. There's somebody cutting down trees. That's not right. We have laws, but our laws are poorly enforced. So we need this empowerment of the local people. This, you know, this new knowledge that's needed into our science processes. So this water connection, it cuts across a lot of conventions, biodiversity, climate, you know. We work with, in the oceans, with, you know, the Minamata Convention. Our beauty eats a lot of fish, and we have to test the hair. We have to, you know, the mothers and the children at risk. So lots of local action going on, but you will hear about it. So that's, that's a response to that question. We want to be included. Our voices are important in this new era going forward. Thank you. Much. Thank you for highlighting how data is important for local people, for local communities. Yes. And this is one of the targets of Global to able to make countries able to generate own data, not only rely on external experts, but also to build very strong internal national capacity. Yes. And here I would like to ask, thank you so much, Fasheris Martin, Yes, um, please, uh, because we just solve the different problems, especially also on small islands. How agencies support member states in different uh, solving in different water-related problems at national, region, and even inter-regional levels? Thank you, Julia, and hello, everybody. The advantage of being the last speaker here on this panel is that I can actually pick up on some of these things that my fellow panelists have said already. And I will start with the ambassador who mentioned that in Paraguay, the IEA is considered to be the most important UN agency supporting the country on dealing with water issues. That is surprising. You might have thought maybe the UN Environment Programme would be the most important UN agency and not the IEA. So we need, to, we need to think, how come that the IEA is linked to the agenda of climate change, of climate adaptation, and of course the water issues? What is that linkage? So if we step back a little bit, you know, the climate crisis is actually a water crisis. Climate crisis manifests itself as a water crisis. If you think about the changing precipitation patterns all around the world, if you think about flooding, even if you think about sea level rise, or if you think about drought, drought is nothing else but the absence of water, in a way. So, so the Climate crisis, when it comes to livelihoods, when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to industry, manifests itself as a water crisis. Now, the IEA, and um, Johannes has explained this, I think, very eloquently, the IEA is not only the nuclear watchdog that is related to the big geopolitics and, and issues happening there that some of you might have seen our DG speaking on CNN and BBC about all the crisis in the world. But, but the IEA is much more. The IEA is also 
an agency that um, does research and promotes nuclear techniques and technologies such as isotope, isotope hydrology uh, techniques that play an important role when it comes to generating data and finding out what is happening to the hydrological cycle, to the water cycle. The water cycle doesn't know any national boundaries. It's transboundary by nature. It's actually a planetary cycle. Remember, I mean, in, in, in school, we, we have uh, learned about the, the, wat the water cycle, you know, the precipitation, then it goes into the river and the ocean, and then uh, it's, it's a truly global issue. So to have a technique available, isotope hydrology, that allows you to trace water drops, you know, each, each water drop has a particular fingerprint, if you want it. That fingerprint can be detected with isotope hydrology techniques. And we can trace the water drops, you know, and much more. You have explained this, Johannes, um, with, with, with the age and the flow of, of water and so on. And that is something very unique and very particular where the, the IA um, comes into play. Let me also um, pick up uh, now on, on on something that Ruth has said. You know, what what are we doing in the space of water? Yes, a little bit of research, but also um, capacity building and, and, and technical cooperation with countries. Now, what does that mean? Capacity building, of course, means also training of scientists who work in the laboratories. And this is where GlowWall, as a network of laboratories, comes into play, because it is a program to train scientists to help them to manage better those isotopic techniques and so on. But capacity building is much more than training of general scientists. It struck me what you said, Ruth, that... Um, not everything can be blamed on climate change. Sometimes poor planning and poor implementation of policies or no enforcement of policies is actually the root cause of water-related crisis that communities are experiencing. So capacity building and the way we do capacity building is also strengthening institutions so that they have better skills in planning and implementing their agenda. So institutional capacity building, which is very different from transferring knowledge to a particular scientist in a laboratory to handle a particular instrument, it's very different. So institutional capacity building is part of the glow wall agenda. And that is what we do in technical cooperation in the IEA, we help our member states to build such capacity so that they can better respond to that water crisis that we are talking about. I will leave it at that, at Julia. Well, and global sounds more or less similar because we are addressing the global challenge now. We are addressing global challenge from networks for increasing the capacity for enhancing it through knowledge transfer, for technology transfer, but also to link between people. What is important for us? To not to have outside local communities, but what everyone have access to the data and there's capacities what we are sharing. And here I would like to back to Ambassador Facetti. Please, can you tell us uh, your vision, how the global network can empower countries to develop water management capacities and support international efforts. As I, as I mentioned, um, the agency, I mean, countries has needs and the need, the agency can, can answer, can, can provide answers to these needs. And as we mentioned, the agency has developed since many years ago, since probably 50 or 40 years ago, um, um, techniques for isotopic hydrology. Um, the agency has not only uh, the equipment, 
but also the technique, the, the protocols. Um, the agency has the experience um, uh, transferring these capacities to other regions, to African nations, to Latin American uh, nations, also in Asia. Um, but also the agency has the capacity um, and the knowledge of putting together experts, scientists, and not only at this level, but also creating an, an interface um, where this um, technical level can discuss the results with uh, politicians, those that are in charge of preparing policies, preparing laws or, or, or instruments of policies such as uh, laws, regulations, etc. Um, so these are the needs we have, and those are the uh, those are the the capacities that the agency has in order to respond to our to our um, uh, needs. The the agency, from my point of view, also is very efficient because it has already um, the interface. Um, in place for every region of the world, uh, for Middle East, for Asia, for Africa, for Latin America, even for Europe. And in this, um, in this uh, region, I mean, in these uh, uh, interfaces, uh, experts can discuss uh, their findings. Um, and experts from different countries, from different regions, can share also these uh, these findings and their knowledge in order to uh, update the capacities of those uh, countries that need more in order to be able to stand at the same level to discuss policies or to discuss the results in order in order to build based on these results ba uh, build uh, policies and instrument of policies so this is, from my point of view, the um, the needs we have and also the answers that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting needs and also gaps, what we need to fill and to reach this level of more or less equal access to all data. So Because we have different gaps in capacities and laboratories and data generation. And those gaps have been very discussed on UN Water Conference. Yes, Johannes, I think you will... Confirm it, and I would like to ask you: What was the step from this UN Water Conference to now? What uh, was done in this period to fill these gaps? What mentioned what our speakers, panelists, and mm. uh, at the global scale? Yeah, I think uh, that question has different dimensions. So there is a political dimension or policy dimension to that, and that's because the UN or we are on our planet 193 member states, so we need to find ways how to motivate, and you know that from your governing councils, we know it from ours, and it's a, it's a process where you have to agree with uh, the UN system alone I represent maybe the UN system together with you or so, and then we have maybe other UN people here, but the UN system alone cannot resolve anything. It can just catalyze and provide the framework and those interactions and interconnections and empower and help people at the technical level. But it's for, first and foremost really a question about do we want to do something together in a different way? Because it's not to scale up our efforts. and scaling up alone will not work. We need to think about what do we need to do differently in our interrelations between the 193 members because it's clear from the water conference that the hydrological cycle that you've talked about is a global common. It makes no sense to break it down into the German part of it and the Russian part of it. And I talked to some German ministers some time ago and it was a very political, very emotional discussion about Russia and then I had to tell them, look, 80% of the green water Germany exports is actually subsidizing the Russian agriculture. So, And you cannot deny that fact. You can also not say, I don't want it for a political reason. It's the earth system. So what has happened since the conference? 
the 193 member states have agreed that they want to follow up from the conference because it had no negotiated outcome. There is no resolute, there is no negotiation from the conference. It's, it's recommendations that are about the water information that you support, the technical aspects. But uh, we have now an agreement that we want to transform a recommendation process into a more, let's agree on something concrete. And together with that comes the development of the UN wide strategy for water and in brackets sanitation, because that's the legacy we have from the Millennium Development Goals. But it's really about mainstreaming water in all the other different discussions and interconnecting the biodiversity, the food, the energy, the climate and water spheres of what is one Earth system. It, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Mm. Which angle you take, you always deal with the same system in the end. So there's now a member state agreement that we need to go beyond and transform the way we work together. And there's a UN process that should help this in terms of developing a strategy. And in the strategy, some of the main catalyzers from what we had before, or what we have now, the global acceleration framework for SDG 6 are reflected. And one of the five is actually data and information where, again, the global is a very important part of that. Thank you very much for updating us about processes, but also reporting on the results what we achieved till now after UN Water Conference. And here I would like to beg to Ruth to continue. So we had a lot of different commitments now that have been done and how you can summarize that, how we can engage local data and local re uh, level, but everything also will be reflected in different processes. For example, in reporting what mentioned by Yo Johannes, so how we can ensure that local community can take voice there. I'm from a small island state and it's always quoted that one of our vulnerabilities is limited human resources. I don't buy that argument because within our island, there's lots of knowledge. People want to contribute, but they're not invited to contribute. When I'm working with the local groups, for example, we were building a community system I need drawings. I need technical drawings to submit. And I would go into a church and I share the project. I share the proposal and somebody's going to put up their hands and say, I will assist. I got a small grant to install 10 solar panels. I, I can't do it. I don't have that background. I go on the radio. Somebody call me up. I will assist you. So a lot of the work is being in time. People want to contribute, but they are not included in the process. So that's why I'm saying, HR, the island is full of skilled people. Cool. And it takes extra work from government to go out to the communities. It's not an eight to four job. You need to go out when the people are there, when on a weekend, an evening, meet with the groups, but nobody want to take the, do that extra work. But that's where you see the success. That's where you see the ambition, the energy of the people, because they want to be part of nation building. And with all these commitments, I think it's 830 commitments made. Of course, how are you going to implement without the people? We can get it done, but we need a new outlook. We need a fresh thinking about the value of people, the value of human resources. Right now, the Jeff Small Grants is the only dedicated funding we have on Ireland because Antigua is classified as a high-income country. And so you're writing to agencies. When I talk to my sister there from South Africa, when she tells me all the grants she's been able to, I said, but I have problems in the because we are high income and a lot of the resources are going to Africa and LDC. So we have to work with in kind. And, you know, 
but we are getting things done. And we are willing to support the government. I assisted the Department of Environment with their adaptation, accreditation, GCF. They wanted to know what kind of processes, models we were using underground. So we contribute, but when it comes to the implementation, the big design of the programs, we are not really included. And we could do more. The targets are urgent. We have to move with haste and keep willing. And once I, you know, I send out the alarm, you know, we need agenda policy, we need this to work. But if you don't include them, if you don't invite them, you're not going to have, you know, that hasty reception, that buy into these processes. So, I want people to start seeing the people different. There's power in the people. We just need to bring out that energy and we'll get things done. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for bringing us this energy. We should always remember about locals. We should always remember about how they're important and voice. And also networking building, not only between scientists or between policy makers. We should be integrated in the networks. Thank you so much. And to conclude our events, I would like to invite Ambassador Moni Jenkins to give her closing remarks. The floor is yours, Moni. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, and I can say I've truly enjoyed this panel. Um, I, wish it, I wish it was going on a little longer because I think there's there's so much here um, and so much to talk about. Um, so as I said, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I know the IAEA very well on all the wonderful work the IAEA is doing, not only on safety, security, uh, uh, safeguards, but in all these other areas that is happening with the IAEA. So I commend uh, the work that they're doing and very happy to continue to work with all of you and uh, DG Grossi and work he's doing. Um, and also um, looking at the role of the IAEA in supporting, you know, important initiatives like uh, global water security needs uh, and also the UN Sustainable Goals, um, which are also important when we talk about Glow 6 and clean water. Um, as we have already heard, there are a few things as essential to our existence as water. Water is life. It is a vital resource that we rely on to protect our health, feed our families, provide energy, grow crops, and sustain wildlife and the environment. Meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goal 6 to achieve universal access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene is central to achieving all of our collective goals. Yet many obstacles remain. Destabilizing conflicts around the world threaten our precious freshwater resources, while climate change further exacerbates stress on those same resources. These dual threats strain economies, worsen inequality and health security, and increase the likelihood that access to water may not only fall victim to a conflict, but trigger a conflict as well. That's why in my role as Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security, I am using all the tools at my disposal to address this critical issue. Often people think of the hard security work my staff does to combat weapons of mass destruction. However, our work goes hand in hand with building a more, a more prosperous world. For example, under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the NPT, the United States has made explicit commitments to leverage the peaceful atom to this end. And for over 50 years, we have honored this commitment, working bilaterally and multilaterally with the IAEA to leverage nuclear science and technology to improve people's lives. For example, we have conducted more than five million, we have contributed more than five million dollars to the IAEA's Peaceful Uses Initiative since 2010 to support IAEA activities that help countries manage portable water resources. With unique expertise in isotope hydrology and experience working with member states, labs, and institutions across sectors, the IAEA is well positioned to help address the water security challenges we see today. Isotope hydrology is a viable tool for collecting the data we need to monitor existing global water resources. It is important that we help countries build capacity for using this tool. It is equally important that we develop standard isotope hydrology data collection techniques 
and norms so that we can create information sharing platforms that help with comparative data analysis. The United States was proud to participate in the IEA's launch of the Global Water Analysis Laboratory Network at the UN Water Conference in March. Through the IEA's Peaceful Uses Initiative, we contributed approximately $650,000 to this to Global, including funding for initial coordination activities and expert technical support. The Global Network will not only support the IAEA's capacity building mission, but it will also encourage the standardization of, of data collection techniques and promote information sharing on a global level. But we must do more. Specifically, we need to work collectively to identify the key data, resources, and skills that we need to develop effective climate change resilience strategies, including uh, incorporating the voices of civil society. In partnership with the United Kingdom, the United States launched the Sustained Dialogue on Peaceful Uses in August 2023 to reduce barriers to access nuclear technologies for peaceful purposes and amplify IAEA programs. With a participant-driven approach, the Sustained Dialogue brings together diverse stakeholders, including national policymakers, the private sector, and the broader international development community to identify the most pressing development needs in a region and actionable steps that should be taken to address them with nuclear science and technology. In doing so, we aim to expand the cohort of nuclear champions who appreciate the full potential for nuclear science to play in addressing the UN SDGs. In June, we, convert, we convene a cadre of experts in Jordan to discuss re responsible water resource management in the Middle East and North Africa and heard a clear need for a more robust monitoring network across the region to provide high quality data. We also heard about shared challenges in creating sustainable laboratory programs in Morocco, Tunisia, and Jordan. Challenges that can be addressed through institutional mentorship like that provided by Glowall. It was clear our partners want Glowall to help build national and regional capacities to understand and manage existing water resources, a key reason for US support to the program. Existential challenges such as those posed by climate change and water insecurity can only be addressed through sustained collaborative efforts. The Global Network is an essential piece of this effort. The United States is proud to have supported it from its launch this past March, and I encourage others in a position to do so to also consider supporting the Global Network so that together we can forge a better future and work towards a water secure world. And I also want to mention that um, my colleagues who are doing the sustained dialogue are actually going to different regions around the world. Um, so we, I mentioned the ones in Jordan and um, in that region, but we're also be doing other such uh, engagements. So I just want folks to also know that as well. But just thank you so much. This has been a great panel. I've learned a lot. So thank you for everything you're doing for this a very important issue. So thank you. Just to close our panel, I would like to thank Ambassador uh, Bonnie Jenkins for her words, closing remarks. I would like to thank all panelists for this amazing sharing, the amazing experience that helped us to develop better. And uh, thank you, auditory, but watch us online. And thanks to all your colleagues, but all other people who is supporting this initiative. Thank you, and let's continue together.